And first and foremost, I want to welcome everybody here tonight. Um, and we are the Federation of Neighborhood. You know what I need to start there with? It's a little awkward for me to be doing this tonight. I normally wouldn't be about me. Um, but the Federation of Neighborhoods, we have lots of board members going to watch an eclipse, you know, that little thing about, you know, eight hours away. Um, so it was either I was going to be the moderator or this wasn't going to happen. And I think this is an awesome opportunity. And I feel like um, even though I am here as a Federation of, of Neighborhoods board member, I still, my day job is reporting to these fine folks up here, um, so and folks out in the audience. Um, but So I am here just to actually ask the questions. I will be re reading Melissa Link's answers, um, but I am in no way, shape, or form the person that came up with these questions. Um, it was a true board effort um, so that I can keep my day job. So I am Suki Jansen, and my day job is the director of solid waste. So now some of you know um, why it's a little awkward for me to be up here, but I feel like I'm passionate about Federation of Neighborhoods. I love that we are packing the room tonight. We have had a, a lot of struggles after COVID getting Federation back off the ground. And Federation, who we are. We are the Federation of Neighborhoods and we present forums for residents to learn more about local issues. We are an independent and nonpartisan community organization in athens Clark County. Our membership includes neighborhood associations and other community organizations and individual members. We need lots of members. Our forums are always free and open to the public. Please consider becoming an individual affiliate member and or encouraging your neighborhood association to become a member. We want to thank Sine for their support of this forum by providing this lab space that we're in tonight at a discount. So tonight we are hosting a candidate forum, not a debate. It is a candidate forum um, featuring candidates running in the competitive athens Clark County Commission races in districts 2, 6, and 8. The forum will begin with questions read by the moderator, me, and then we will open the floor to question, questions and answers from the Athens community. We like to keep things neighborly here at the Federation of Neighborhood Forums, so please be respectful in this space for people to hear about issues in their community. Also, when it comes to the question and answer portion, you all, we do ask that it's a question. And I'm a middle school teacher at heart. I taught for five years uh, middle school, and questions start with question words. Who, what, when, where, how. Um, and so please make sure they are questions um, and, and that you are respectful tonight. You know, we've had kind of, you know, interesting times. Uh, even in our department, people calling us in our department <laughs> interesting names that has nothing to do with solid waste. And it's all about politics, and it's unfortunate because um, some of them are our neighbors and stuff, and solid waste has nothing to do with a lot of that stuff. We just want to get your trash, recycling, and compost picked up. Uh, so if we could make sure we're respectful to each other and the candidates here tonight, I would appreciate it. And... Now on to the more important things, the panelists. Um, I will be reading Melissa Link's um, at the end, um, but I want to introduce the panelists tonight. First, I'll just um, uh, tell you their names, and then we'll start with Jason and let them introduce themselves. But from District 2, we have Jason Jacobs, and we'll come back to him in just a second. District 6, we have Rashi Malcolm and Stephanie Johnson. And District 8, we have Sydney Waters and Carol Myers. And so if, um, J I'm going to hand the mic off to Jason, and if you just introduce yourself just a little bit more and why you chose to run for a seat in District 2. Okay. Uh, Jason Jacobs um, came here to Athens to go to college uh, back in 2002 and uh, never wanted to leave. I uh, met my wife here. Uh, we started our family here. Um, I think the big reason that I got into wanting to run, I just felt like well, initially, I, I wanted to have a choice. I think Melissa was running unopposed, and I got in, want, wanted to make a difference and um, really focus on some of the issues that I felt I had that were being unheard. Um, not, I mean, I guess heard, but not really being qualified. I felt like uh, there were some things that I saw going around the town that I wanted to address, and I would make the email and kind of go up the chain and then find the next person, and they just weren't getting answered. And other things were uh, being looked at that I felt like, um, you know, my, my voice was getting lost in the mix, and having talked to a lot of neighbors, I felt that they had the same thing. So I wanted to get in and, and make a difference. Um, I'm also a business owner. I wanted to look at some of the problems that we have as a community from a, a different perspective um, and really um, be more efficient with the uses and the resources that we have and, and be local uh, in those uh, solutions that we do have. And um, 
I really listen to those in my community and put their needs first. Try not to speak. <laughs> my name is Rashi Malcolm. Um, I'm also a, a local business owner. Um, I own Rashi's Cuisine. I'm the chef owner, and I'm also the founding director for the Culinary Kitchen of Athens, as well as Farm to Neighborhood. I got into this race. Um, really, it was it was it was a push from my daughter. It was a challenge. Um, I'd sat on a lot of boards where I always ended up becoming part of governance um, because I took the leap of faith and decided that, you know, I didn't know a whole lot about the government. About five, six years ago, um, I thought I knew. I didn't really know until I signed up um, to uh, go on to the um, Industrial Development Authority. Um, and from there, I learned a lot <laughs> and then worked my way up to chairman. And when I was taking my daughter around all around the state, I mean, we were following congressmen, senators, uh, local elections. We were going to Republican meetings, Democrat meetings, um, different churches. Um, she pointed out to me that when you go, everyone who's supposed to be in the same room, we're still fighting and arguing with each other. I'll tell a quick story, even you know, with Tim, she walked up to Tim and she said, well, maybe people in the room wouldn't be arguing if you fed them at night. You know? So when we got home that night, she said, mommy, she said, nobody's listening to each other. They're saying the same thing, but they're not listening to each other. And I said, baby, when you get old enough, I can't wait till you run the world because she wants to be a politician. She said, but what are you doing? And so I decided to enter into the race. So that's me. Hi, everybody. My name is Stephanie Johnson, and I'm running for District 6 Commissioner. And I decided to, well, I, let me back up and say the conversation started in my household um, about two years ago. My husband and I are really engaged, and we watch the mayor commission meetings every Tuesday. And uh, factoid, if you ever have trivia about Stephanie Johnson, I've watched um, most of the mayor commission meetings all the way back to 2008. And so I find myself well-versed. I'm a former employee of the unified government. I worked in the finance department as well as the Office of Operational Analysis. And I have more than 15 years experience in corporate America. So I decided to run because we're sitting there on the couch and we are, we are debating some of the issues that are on the floor and there are obvious questions that are missing. And you're screaming at the television, you're saying, well, someone please just ask this question. And so some of the big takeaways that I, I'm not, I'm disenchanted with are the, the inefficiencies within the government, the, the, the um, fiscal spending, the lack of accountability, outcomes data. We have a number, several hundred um, nonprofits that receive funding, and there is a very tiny portion of that large group that that has to undergo any type of finance or compliance um, checks. Those things are really important to me, and it speaks to my background. I, I can view and see anomalies in operations as well as fiscal data, and so there was a conversation we had in October, September, October of last year, and I was complaining. And if you've heard me speak before, you're going to know what I'm going to say next. My mom would always say, if you have a complaint, get it out. And that, and let that to be it. But don't, I don't want to hear it again. Because what you need to do next is learn how to love it or figure out how to fix it. And so I started to ruminate over that and over the weeks decided, you know, it's a shame to know how to do the job and not stand up for the chip, for the test and not stand up and serve my community. And so that's why I'm running. I grew up here. I have family here. My church is here and I'm invested. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sydney Waters. And yes, most of you know me as Mama Sid. Very few people know who Sydney Waters is. I am almost a 47 year resident of District 8. For a couple of years, I moved into Mariah Parker's uh, district, and, and they they, I got redistricted back into District 8. Uh, I have told Carol I have no animosity towards her or what she has done whatsoever. I just want to be a different voice on the board, a voice of common sense. It seems that we have gotten so, so far out in, 
in 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 building apartments, uh, uh, running people out with 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 rent increases. Uh, District Eight, I don't, I, District Eight is sort of overlooked with our government. All of the all of the the recreation centers are all within what I call the old city limits. We need something in District 8 for our youth so that high school and middle school students have somewhere to go after school to try to stay out of trouble. Yes, we have gangs here now. We have gangs with guns. This is serious. We have a bad drug problem in Athens and in District 8. Our infrastructure is falling down. I have owned a, a business on Barnett Shoals for 41 years. Kroger wasn't there. Uh, Aldi wasn't there. There was nothing over there but Golden Pantry on one end and a Fina gas station all the way down on the other corner in Georgetown Shopping Center in Piggly Wiggly. I have seen so many changes, but I've seen the most progress in downtown and west side. I think it's time for District 8 to have a little bit more and a voice of common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Carol Myers, District 8 County Commissioner, um, and I have been serving in City Hall for the last um, four years. I am very hardworking, consider myself to have a lot of common sense, um, and I want to continue doing the work that I've been doing uh, all along. Um, I've been 40 years in Athens and 30 on the east side, just a little background information. I retired from a long career at Athens Tech where I was mostly teaching, uh, but also in leadership roles at the end, raised two daughters there, have three grandchildren, two of them who actually got moved out of District 8. Um, and I've been civically involved since I got here. Um, I was just uh, remembering how my first canvassing was for the Mondale Ferraro presidential campaign. That's a long time ago. Uh, worked on different women's issues uh, before I started having children, then spent some time working in sports groups, coaching, those kind of things that you do when you have children. Um, after they grew up, I got very involved in local politics, working with local, uh, to help others get elected. Uh, mostly I just wanted to help them get elected because I had another job to do and that took a lot of hours. Um, so I wanted to get them elected, but I'm retired now um, and I want to continue some of the work that I've been, did before becoming on the commission when I worked on different alternative transportation issues. And also, I'm going to mention the Athens 100% Renewable Energy Initiative, because it is something that I, it's very, um, I'm very passionate about. It's a common sense uh, approach to dealing with our climate issues, as well as helping people in their uh, pocketbooks. And it's not one uh, included in any of the questions that we're getting tonight. Anyway, I look forward to um, talking with you. Thank you, Federation of Neighborhoods. This is actually thrilling, because think four, four years back, what was going on? I was not knocking on doors, and I was not in public forums. If there was a public forum, it was on Zoom. So this is really nice to be here with real people. For sure. Thank you all. I'm going to put a different hat on, um, and I'm going to be Melissa Link for a second. So I, I, we did promise to read her statement that she sent in, so bear with me as I read it again. Melissa Link, Chris, make sure you put that on the video that I am not imparting my own uh, opinions here. Thank you for allowing me to submit this statement, and I apologize I'm unable to be here tonight as I'm journeying back from a long-planned eclipse-chasing uh, trip with my spouse and our widowed mothers. It's been a very d difficult few years for our families, and we are extremely privileged to share this once-in-a-lifetime celestial event with the woman who brought us into the world. I want to thank the many who have reached out with words of support through it all. Most of you know me very well and know that I stand for all I've accomplished. In my 10th year on the commission, I'm more committed than ever to protecting our neighborhoods and standing up for marginalized peoples in these frightening times when our community and unity is increasingly targeted by anti-democratic legislators, predatory profiteers, and violent right-wing extremists alike. 
I affirm that this is no time to be silent to these matters and even indulge those who uh, <clears throat> would disenfranchise and discredit our local democracy by trafficking conspiracy theory, bigotry, and lies to be complicit in the very forces that seek to, um, to elicit violence and pave the way for, sorry, I should have read my, um, had my glasses on y'all, sorry, and pave the way for an autocratic theocracy that has already begun to enact its agenda via state legislatures across the nation. I will not triangulate, nor will I check my tone in calling out the proto-fascist movement that hacks away at the foundations of our democracy and threatens the very lives of so many whom I hold dear. I remain committed to making day-to-day -day life better for the people of District 2, the diverse in-town neighborhoods in which I've lived, worked, played, and served uh, my entire 30-plus years in Athens. My record of service is long, and I began pretty much as soon as I arrived as a 22-year-old grad student in 1993 from the Lindenhouse Art Center to the Human Rights Festival, to AthFest, the Athens Arts Council, the Cultural Affairs uh, Commission, Georgia Climate Change Coalition, Historic Athens, the Athens Land Tra Trust, the Boulevard Neighborhood Association, the Boulevard Gardening Club, and more. I've worked hard to make Athens a better place long before I was elected to do so. I will cont continue to bring experience, effective, empathetic, proactive, and outspoken progressive leadership to the community, despite the often vile and violent harassment and threats hurled at me from all online trolls who cower behind keyboards. It's not lost on me that I am targeted even more viciously because I'm a woman who is unafraid to speak truth to power. I am proud of all I have accomplished as your commissioner, and while I don't always see eye to eye with all my colleagues, I regularly take the lead in compromise. I believe it is the secret sauce of democracy. On a clearly divided commission the past year, I've led the way in assuring Barber Street gets properly protected bike infrastructure, negotiated terms for accountability and sustainability, in strategic plans to prevent homelessness and increase affordable housing and instigated for reasonably regulated short-term rentals. During the incredibly perilous times of 2020, I served as the chair of the Clark County Board of Health, bringing accurate excuse me, accurate data and scientific truth back to the commission to inform local policy to keep our community as safe as possible. Despite the challenges presented by both the state of Georgia and UGA, despite the, sorry, that was a really bad pause, sorry y'all. Um, during unprecedented uh, tensions, I also took the lead in negotiating a public safety and justice budget package that we are now beginning to see pay off significantly, decreased crime rates across the board throughout our community. I've long held a keen interest in the intersection of zoning, historic preservation, affordable housing, and cultural identity. I've called upon this to save the Mac Burney House and several historic homes for perpetual affordable housing and in the traditionally African-American West Hancock Historic District, as well as establish a West Downtown Local Historic District to assure our beloved downtown remains the unique cultural center that defines Athens for so many. I brought attention to the unjust destruction of Lindtown over 60 years ago, paving the way for official acknowledgement and reparations for this nearly forgotten black neighborhood. I urged, I, I urged the inclusion of over 30 million in SPLOST funding for affordable housing, and I also agitated, I agitated to save the Murmur Trestle, insisting upon the public input process that restored much of the iconic original structure in the magnificent new Firefly Trail Bridge. Um, lastly, I will be implementing the particular, this particular knowledge in the coming year as we undergo once every 20 years future land use planning process. I've repeatedly encouraged my constituents to participate in the process, and I regularly attend the public meetings, engaging with citizens to help trans, translate information and fully comprehend con concerns from diverse aspects of our community to encourage affordable housing, environmental protection, economic development, quality of life, and cultural preservation as we continue continue to grow. I believe this diversity is the greatest strength of our community, and only by honoring and encouraging it can we assure a prosperous and sustainable future. From Melissa Link. All right. Thanks again for being here, you all. Wendy's going to try to keep time for us. We're asking, I think, she's down there, so she'll maybe try to flag you down, uh, and I will as well. Um, we'll get, what we say, two minutes per question, roughly two minutes, because we want to make sure that the audience gets a chance to ask you all questions. Um, so we'll go ahead, and you know what? We'll start this question. Um, we won't always go to you, Jason. We won't put you on the spot every time. So we'll go to Carol. We'll let Carol start this one. Commissioner Myers, you're going to start this question off for us. 
The first question, both rental and purchased homes are becoming increasingly unaffordable for medium and low income residents. How should athens Clark County address the affordable housing crisis? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy out there with uh, housing at this point. I know about it on a very personal level. I have my daughter and son-in-law trying to get by on some low-income local work and renting a house that costs them 1200 an apartment for 1200 a month with the two bedrooms. Um, I was able to buy a house a couple of years ago, but I don't know if I could do it now because it's a, another 150000 now. So it, it's very hard right now for... Um, renters and for homeowners, and uh, that's a, one of the biggest issues we need to address. Uh, one of the things I did, and, and some of my uh, people up here were like making, teasing me a little bit. They said, I didn't know it was an open book uh, you know, forum, but for me, it's always an open uh, book forum. Uh, th that's why I need a lot of room at my desk in City Hall, because I always come very prepared. And I do want to mention that we have the athens Clark County Affordable Housing Investment Strategy. So one of the things I'm going to do, because I know people don't like us to spend money on plans and then not use them. So my thing to do is I have all these plans at my desk at home and I'm looking at them. What are we doing with affordable housing here? Uh, one thing, there's really three parts to this. We have to identify funding. And one of those ways to identify funding is to going a local housing fund. And that's something we're going to have to address in our budget that we'll be working on shortly. We need to have $5 million a year in that, that, that bucket. We also need to build and preserve quality, affordable rental homes. Um, and make sure that we are helping pi private and, and public uh, entities to use our low the federal low-income housing tax credit developments. And there's some more in here as well. I, obviously, this would take me a long time. Uh, the last part is to expand home ownership and help people stay in their homes. Um, one, one of the things I found most interesting was that in Athens, we think of homeowning as something you're able to do if you have a lot of money. One in three homeowners in Athens makes less than $50,000 a year. Um, the, in the last couple of months, we were able to, I'm very proud of this, uh, approve a program to help first-time home buyers with their down payments. And this was money that was coming through the Athens Justice and Memory Project, an outshoot of all our work with Linentown, um, and our ongoing commitment to reparations for victims of the urban renewal period of the, the 60s and 70s. And this is a program with First Athens Bank and Trust for uh, a grant of $780,000. They're going to make a loan program for low-income people to stay in their homes, get put down as down payments. Um, I'm going to end up and there, so I don't talk for 30 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Myers. Um, go ahead, Sydney. Um, do you need me to repeat the question? If you at any time, just let me know. No, but, just okay. Basically, I have it. Uh, I, I see a problem with uh, with us creating more linen towns, uh, with rental increases going up and up and up. People can't afford the housing that they have, so they move out because they can't afford it. There's no affordable housing for them to move to. But instead of uh, us approving uh, low-income housing being built, we continue to build, build high-rise, uh, expensive apartments, duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes. Uh, I see this as as basically trying to run uh, a certain group of people out of town uh, to create a more hub, if you would, uh, more more areas concentrating on housing, so that so that instead of having cars, you will use buses to move around. I see this as as getting rid of the classic city that we used to know how it existed. And uh, I know that I bought a condo three, uh, 10 years ago. The first house I bought in 1977, it took 36 years for that house to increase 300%. My condo has increased 300% in 10 years. So something's wrong there. We, uh, we, we, we have a problem with, with, with creating, uh, an atmosphere 
of put, allowing uh, parents and real estate agents and other entities to buy homes in what used to be the R2 neighborhoods and renting. I know it's supposed to be only two unrelated, but you have three, four, five people living in a three-bedroom house, and this is ongoing. So we are losing the classic city that we used to have for what is progress? Thank you, Stephanie. Would you please repeat the question? Yes, of course. Um, both rental and purchased homes are becoming increasingly unaffordable for medium and low income residents. How should athens Clark County address the affordable housing crisis? Okay, so if you see me jotting down notes, I, I, I note take all day. This is just my thing. And so when I hear something that I don't want to forget, I actually um, jot down the notes. So I jot, jotted down three different things. The first thing is, you know, we, there is such something to say about the number of investors that we have allowed into our community that live out of state. And I think, you know, first addressing that, um, there has to, I, I do understand that we cannot supersede whatever the state law is when it comes to controlling rental, rental prices and housing, um, increases. But as a local government, we, there has to be something that we can do at the government level to maybe create an ordinance that sounds something similar to the investor group, and a member of the investor group needs to live on site. And I think the, the results of investor groups that can come into our community and purchase 100 parcels at a time, it is, it is devastating, it's destructive, it increases the cost overnight of that property, and then that leads to the individuals being individuals that rent and or own being priced out of their property if they're owners they you know it's going to be a matter of time before their taxes are um, too expensive and if they're renters they can no longer afford the big hike in rent the second thing that i wrote down is recruitment is a very similar very similar equation when we're out as the economic development department or someone else recruiting businesses to our community, the same result happens. We bring in businesses um, under the guise of economic development, which our community desperately needs. But there has to be a sweet spot where we are recruiting individuals that are coming into our community, but not driving the cost of our property up. Because what happens is they stay and we end up leaving. So that's, it's, 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 I'm not providing solutions, but I'm providing some things to think about, some things that I think about, because I do believe they're all related. And the last thing is zoning. Affordable housing, you can't discuss affordable housing until you understand zoning. I'm going to admit, I know what I know, and I also know what I don't know. I am not that familiar with the zoning laws, rules, and regulations, but I've been watching meetings for seven months, and so hopefully I will be soon. What I'm getting to is that there are so many different narratives when it comes to zoning and how the result ends up with an affordable parcel. Our decisions haven't been that way lately, but it's something to think about. Recruitment of economic development opportunities, our zoning changes and or variances, and the last one is let's re figure out how to regulate our investor groups that are coming in from outside of the state of Georgia. Thank you, That's Stephanie. It. Thank you. Thank you. Rashi. Oh, I have your microphone. Oh, will it stress? Do you yeah, mind? Yes, it will. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Share, share. Thank you. Of course. Both rental and purchased homes are becoming increasingly unaffordable for medium and low income residents. How should ACC address the affordable housing crisis? So I'm, I had a three point, but I'm going to start with zoning just because I'm going to piggyback off of what you say, because zoning is important. We really do need to take a look at, you know, how we're permitting uh, for these properties. 
Um, I'm definitely a big component on let's get to utilizing a lot of these abandoned homes. Let's utilize the community land that we own. Um, I heard Carol mention about the $5 million investment, um, but people get scared when they hear that because they think that $5 million is going to go to, as Stephanie stated, outside investors. If we're using our county land that we own, or AKA land banks, um, and, and we're investing our tax dollars in those homes, then it makes more sense to talk about the affordability and how we can build and who we can bring in and how we can partner, what other additional finances that, you know, we could be able to bring into the county. So permitting, zoning, using the county land that we already have, and definitely we have a lot of abandoned buildings, both in the commercial sector as well as in the residential sector. You know, we have people that, um, there are programs out there, but people don't know um, so that they can keep their homes. You know, we have a lot of constituents in District 6 as we've been going around talking to them, like, hey, I want to be able to keep my home, but I don't feel I can because it's falling apart. Well, guess what? There are programs out there, but we're not doing a good enough job, um, whether it's the local government or as nonprofits who receive funding from the local government, letting them know that these programs are actually available. You brought up the First American Bank with the down payment assistance. That's the same thing. There's probably a lot of people in this room who never heard that they could have an opportunity to get that funding. But then at the same time, constituents say, well, that's great. You got down payment assistance, but I can't can't afford the houses that are out here. So again, we need to look at how we're permitting. We need to look at um, when developers want to develop, you know, how, how much red tape are we putting them through to build? And then we also have to consider that there is a such thing as the cost you know, of materials, right? So the more we build, the faster we build, you know, the more, as we saw in COVID, the more people are like, oh, I got you. You know, you have to now buy me out of a pro project that I'm doing. I'm sorry, my time is up. Thank you, Rashi. Jason, we have to share. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I would agree um, with a lot of the different ideas here. I, I, one thing that I would like to focus on is incentivizing, especially local builders uh, that come in. I feel like I've, I've talk to some local builders in, in my community that have some great ideas to use some space and they run into uh, zoning issues and maybe putting some ADUs uh, in and, you know, cutting down the horizontal costs, maybe doing fourplexes and cutting down those horizontal costs to make people, to make it easier for people to get into that housing market initially. I think a lot of young people that work for us, they don't really have a lot of hope of getting in that housing market. And I do feel like there's a, a missing middle class or missing workforce housing that we're not really addressing. And if we could uh, increase the inventory, obviously, I think supply and demand would just say that, that some of those values are going to come down. And I think there's some pitfalls to that, too, that we have to address when you talk about increased traffic and things of that nature. But those are things, I think, working together uh, when you do have local builders with a stake in the community, they're going to make much more informed decisions uh, when they do build those homes uh, for the, the needs of the community. Even looking around in our neighborhood, you see a lot of uh, historic homes, they have two doors on the front. Well, that was what was needed then. They needed a, a multi-family uh, home in that area to serve the need of that community then. I think we need to look at some of those zoning laws, make it a little bit easier, especially for local builders to come. If you want to keep some of the outside investors from coming in, maybe make it easier where you don't have to hold on to a loan, get an approval over uh, 11 months before you even know if you can build something. If we can kind of fast track some of those local stakeholders in uh, building those homes, I think we could uh, vastly increase in a quality way and still maintain the quaintness of Athens um, and still keep it kind of what it is while growing um, the inventory of homes and bringing prices down overall. Awesome. And I have uh, a short paragraph from Melissa. So this is from Melissa on the, the, to answer that question. Uh, we can continue to invest in the construction of affordable housing, but we also must acknowledge the pressure on ever and 
pressure an ever-growing population of wealthy students puts on the local housing market in our in-town neighborhoods. We need to identify appropriate areas in the vicinity of the entire perimeter of UGA's campus to enable future student housing construction, and we must identify appropriate areas throughout the community that are ideally suited for carefully designed increased density while protecting the historically black in-town communities from further student gentrification. All right, we'll go on to question two. How should athens Clark County address homelessness? What is the desired result? What short-term and long-term funding might be available to address the problem? We'll start with Jason this time, Commissioner Myers. So and then we'll start with the middle folks. Well, obviously the, the long-term solution would be to solve it and have everybody in a home. Um, I think our focus as a town uh, needs to be uh, on focusing some on the root causes. I think a lot of times we address the, the symptoms. I think an, an efficiency uh, of using uh, the resources that we have. Um, I had a chance to be on the Athens Homeless Coalition and uh, there's some great minds uh, in that in that space that really are working towards some, some good solutions. I feel like bringing them together and starting to use the resources we have here locally in a coordinated effort to address some of the issues that we have uh, with homelessness is gonna be a, a big improvement. Um, I think we got to look at, at the efficiency with which we're spending these dollars. I, I hearken back to the, the 2.2 million we spent on, on 52 tents. And if you've heard me speak about this, it was, you know, $2,000, uh, per month per tent. And I just feel like we can do better than, than tents for that type of money and provide opportunities to lift yourself up as well. I think one of the parts of the plan, uh, the strategic plan to prevent homelessness that kind of, uh, stuck with me was, there's only $30,000 of the uh, almost $5 million allocated to lived experience. I think that could be a huge resource for us to look at people who have lived experience in, in homelessness and use them almost like a, a mentorship to kind of guide those trying to come out in, in, in that way. I also think, speaking about those root causes, uh, we need to look at, at some mental health resources, substance abuse issues. We have to address those things of the why uh, people are in the homeless situation, as well as that, you know, that working mom um, who's working a 40 hour a week job, but maybe is, uh, you know, one broken arm or unexpected bill away from uh, being out on the street. I think we have to really focus some resources on that uh, in the prevention side of things. So I'd like to see a, a very effective and efficient use of the resources we have and the local knowledge that is really great in this town. People have been working on this on the ground and many, you know, for a long time. And I think going outside um, of Athens uh, takes away from some of the specific things that we have to deal with as a community. I'd like to look again for more local uh, localized solutions from a lot of people working in the industry. So I went back and forth a couple of times about this question and I'm just gonna be straight up honest. How do we solve the homeless problem? I could put out as many thoughts and processes as possible. I am not an expert in, in homelessness. I do believe, you know, it, it's about, you know, like disease, we, we, we treat the symptoms, you know, we constantly treat the symptoms, but we never actually get to the root of why we have the issues we have. There are a lot of towns around this country um, that have been able to, and organizations that have been able to pretty much help alleviate homelessness in their areas. And I know that the Homeless Coalition that has been put together has been talking and working with those groups. Um, again, a lot of these organizations are open to the public. So you can sit in, you can listen, you can you know um, watch the feeds when they have these meetings. Um, I know that they have another discussion at the work session tomorrow. So I'm very interested to see what they're coming up with. But I'm, I would definitely have to be honest and refer this to the experts um, in homelessness um, for us to be able to address it. Um, I don't want to just be one to just spit out and talk um, because that's just, it, it's not my wheelhouse, but I'm definitely up for learning more um, about what the Homeless Coalition comes up with because as Jason stated, they have a lot of wonderful people who have been doing this for, for you know, 25, 50 years um, before the issue became what it is, what we see today. Some of them are in the room. Um, uh, yeah. The Homeless Coalition staff in the room watching you right now. Um, go ahead, Stephanie. Okay. 
I think before we can talk about homeless and how to fix it, we need to understand what the unified government's plan is. Do they want to fix the problem, like eradicate it? Or do they want to manage it? Because both of those are two different silos of, of, of um, challenges and that leads to setting up a plan to, to execute, to hopefully find success. But that has never been identified. So we don't know what we're doing. Are we trying to fix it? Are we kicking the can? Or are we trying to manage it? And I think it's a very expensive can that we're kicking. I think there are several pockets of, of, of people that are part of the homeless population that, um, well, let me go back and say, there is a federal program um, ran through the CDBG Home or the Housing and Community Development Department that actually monitors a home program and the homeless program. And they are required to go out um, I'm not sure if more than annually, but at least annually, and count the population and, and capture those numbers and report back to HUD. So for years, they've known a general amount of the number of homeless individuals in our community. I'm, I'm gonna pause right there, we're gonna file that away, but I'm gonna come back to it. We have a number, let's talk about our homeless populations. We have individuals who are addicted, we have individuals who are, are um, mentally challenged, we have individuals who are unhoused, that, and unhoused meaning that this individual has a full-time job and probably a, a, a few children, and they live out of their house because they can no longer afford their mortgage or their rent. But they are hardworking individuals like everyone, you all in this room, and, and that is um, heartbreaking. And then we have a population in real life that wants to continue being homeless. So after we decide if we're going to fix it or manage it, we need to decide which buckets and pockets and you know, different silos that these individuals fit in. And what I'm going to get to next is we have accountability courts that our chief judges um, and the superior court judges, they actually monitor. We have a veterans um, accountability court. We have um, drug court, and we also have, I think there is a um, DUI court. S Stephanie, um, that, if you could wrap it up real quickly. Oh, I am so, so sorry. Sorry. Uh, that's, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know how to close it out, but <laughs> that's, where, that's what my thoughts are. Thank you. I, I tend to look at where we started with the homeless. Our government invited them here. I don't know if they ever considered the effect that this would have on our town and on our taxpayers. Uh, we need to look at the people who have come here for a hand out and those who have come here for a hand up. We have both. I have sat in the Kroger parking lot at College Station Road and watch the van come through and let the second shift out and put the first shift in the van and go through park, go through all the parking lot and through Publix doing that. This is, this is basically pimping. These people are not homeless. I know for a fact because they have told me so they can make three to four hundred dollars a day standing on a corner begging. If you notice, they, they, they used to have nice signs a long time ago, but they've discovered using a piece of cardboard works better. My store has been feeding the homeless for since the, since the early 2000s. We get to know them. They tell us their problems. Some of them have great, great drug problems. Some of them are just trying to make it day to day. But our main thing is, we have them, what are we going to do? But my, my main concern over the homeless is the taxpayers who have lost their homes and don't have any place to go either. I think our taxpayers are our first concern. You go to Greenville, South Carolina, you don't see this. They have handled their problem. There are solutions 
I do not think that our government is actually looking for solutions. Well, we're going to have to differ on that. I think the government's looking for lots of solutions. Um, and I want to address a few things here. One is the idea that uh, athens Clark County is inviting people in. Um, athens Clark County is a hub for services. I'm going to bring up an interesting point, because at our commission-defined option that, that's, that we put forth when we passed the homelessness ARPA funding, one of the things that we requested that the mayor and the county manager do was to follow up and reach out to communities in, a, in the region, and they've done that. And they've reached out to like uh, governments and hospitals within 60 miles, talking to them about not bringing, drop coming and bringing people here. Uh, one of the things I just uh, learned interestingly was that other places that have services like Covington, Georgia, are also dealing with exactly the same kind of problems we have because people go to where there are services. Um, so that's, that's one thing. A, a second thing, I'm going to pull back a little bit. Actually, maybe I'm going to pull in because when people talk about homelessness, one of the things that no one is saying up front is that people, um, co people complain about there being homeless people on our streets. Um, and that's an issue, and people see people in the woods and everywhere else. Um, and it makes people feel uncomfortable. It also sometimes affects people's, you know, where they are and where they're living here. One, one of the things that I am, feel very proud of is that I have developed relationships um, across this county with different people working in the homeless um, support services so that the street outreach uh, people who are working with uh, Advantage Behavioral Health, when there's an issue, I can tell people to call the police, but I can also reach out to the street outreach people because I've developed those relationships. I've talked with people who are working in the, uh, the recovery community. Um, I've talked with the homeless providers. One of the things that I'm able to do as a, you know, retired <laughs> educator is be a very full-time commissioner who spends a lot of time building relationships with different people across the community. I also want to join, you know, here I am with my homework again, the strategic plan to reduce and prevent homelessness. I want to say right away, I don't think this is a government plan. This is a plan that many people in this community worked on, including the homeless providers. These are their ideas come forth. We are using them and implementing them. Um, if you want to find out what's going on with the, the next uh, use of funds for homelessness, we will be discussing that tomorrow at the work session where we will talk about the people who, the different organizations have that put in things for, for all different kinds of services. So some of them are I need to you deal to Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> and it's really awkward for me, Commissioner Myers. I'll, I'll, put, <laughs> so. <laughs> I'll put the rest on, on Facebook. Facebook Live. Sorry. And I do want to cover um, Commissioner Link's statement as well for this question. So this is Commissioner Link's statement. We end homelessness by putting people in homes and providing them with the proper support to stay in those homes. These homes and the support needs to come in all shapes and sizes. Six months ago, a long overdue strategic plan to reduce and prevent homelessness was adopted by the Mayor Commission. It lays out six goals and 10 strategies, most to be initiated or overseen by a reformed and properly staffed homeless coalition of dedicated and divert diverse, experienced organizations. The plan includes $5 million in initial funding, but the long-term success of this plan is fully dependent on support from the community at large, including faith-based organizations, um, varied nonprofit entities, and service organizations, educational and healthcare institutions, neighborhood organizations, as well as for-profit entities, including uh, major employers, financial institutions, developers, and landlords. All right. I think I made it, my two minutes or less, right? Okay. Um, all right, we'll go on to the, the next question. And Rashi, you're gonna be the first one. We'll let you be the first one this time, Rashi. Um, ha what, if any changes, and I can hand, oh, I can hand this over. What if any changes are needed to ensure public safety in athens Clark County? What funding and from what source um, could be used to implement any of the changes that you want to discuss? So for me, public safety is more than about just police on the streets. Um, public safety is about our infrastructure. Um, 
it's about our way of life. It's about how we feel about our community. It's the way we communicate within our community. Um, because again, if you have an issue with your neighbor and you do it out, now you need to call the police. Um, we've heard up here, uh, many have mentioned about the mental health in our community. So I will start by saying that I feel like we have put in place so many coalitions and nonprofits and um, boards, <laughs> and um, we have so many uh, different initiatives and programs that are all bringing in money, which is why you hear about, well, we have all these nonprofits and they're getting all this money and the government is, is, is funding all these things. I think that what we need to do is start utilizing what we already have and not always continue to start new initiatives. We need to start utilizing partnerships um, within our community for what we have. If you want to talk about not having to always go out and find funding or having your funding feel stretched, then we need to start working together. There are so many different organizations um, that are here that are providing. It's not the exact same service. I do not, I do not want to offend. It is not the exact same service. Many of us are looking at the, and I include myself, many of us are looking at the challenges and issues that um, surround our community and we all just want to do our best. So how do we fix public safety and how do we fund that? We start first by becoming a community again. Is that my time out? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I, I'm in my groove. <laughs> but, you know, we start first by becoming a community again. We start by knowing our neighbors' names again. You know, we start by looking out for our children. We start by knowing our teachers' names. You know, this is how we start with public safety. This is how we, you know, those things are free. You, you didn't have to go and look for any government funding, you know, or ask for taxpayers' money for those things. And so for me... That's where we need to start. We need to start back with collaborative efforts. And I think that's the first step to changing our public safety and funding it. I'm going to try to speed talk this one, okay? <laughs> and I apologize. So with public safety, there are there's a, a four-prong approach that I think is, is effective. And I remember when I was a little girl that in our neighborhoods, and I lived in six, five different neighborhoods in District 6 alone. And I remember when I was younger that police officers actually drove through your neighborhood on a regular basis, and then sometimes they would get out. And they got to know us, and they got to know our parents, and they knew if we were doing something we weren't supposed to. They checked on us and they essentially helped our parents raise us without directly doing so, but their presence was enough. I think um, if there was something to improve in our public safety um, um, departments, it is the accountability. There is there are some issues, and I always say it's the few that, that create a problem for the many. Our public safety professionals, they have a difficult time being motivated and having high morale to go into the job when they're all getting um, scrutinized by the actions of a few. So very quickly after an event occurs, start with accountability, go through the process of, of doing an investigation, and then the third component is actually make a decision on the investigation and make sure if it involves a citizen, that citizen is made aware of the results. Oftentimes I hear that we never knew what happened. We reported it, there was an investigation. I think bridging all of those communication gaps makes everyone feel included and also a part of the, the situation. And then at the end, I hope that getting out of the car, learning the neighborhoods, learning the parents, and, and getting to know the students and what they're capable of will restore public trust. The last thing I want to communicate when it comes to public safety, it's not just police or fire, it's all five, probation, corrections, sheriff, uh, police and fire, there is a gigantic discrepancy in the amount that they are being paid as a starting salary. That needs to be fixed. At the end of the day, when they all go out to do their job, 
They do not know what they are going to encounter when they when they go to a door. And that's something that, unless you go through Citizens Police Academy, which is phenomenal, you don't really grasp the whole totality of what that means. There is still fear, and that fear should not be mitigated or reduced by eight or $10,000 from one department to the other. That's, that is in itself is creating our own um, short staffing. And that's all. You made it. You made it. Um, great job, Stephanie. I held my breath. <laughs> the first step for public safety doesn't cost a penny. It's telling them you're doing a good job, a good pat on the back. Morale is low within our public safety fire department, police department. Our police are operating at 67% of employees. They try to be around 250, 256 officers, but they, are, but they are not at that point yet. For a city the size of Athens, we're actually rated for 350 police officers. This would put an officer in the neighborhoods, as Stephanie was talking about. I remember when I moved here, in downtown, the police presence was very, very evident. You felt safe. A police officer came through my neighborhood of University Heights routinely. Now, you never see an officer drive through. We are hurting insofar as, as our support of our public safety. Our, fire, our firefighters, I talked with one today, a family of four. His insurance costs $17,000 a year. He may make a good salary, but not when you're paying out $17,000 for insurance. I think we need to step back and look at what we are offering to those people who are the first we call on. We may run them down a lot. But who's the first we call? The police. I know we are planning very high-rise apartments that we do not have a fire truck to reach. We're putting the cart before the horse. We need to be sure that our, our fire equipment is up to date and that our salaries welcome officers to come here. Thank you. Thank you. Public safety. I am 100% in, in, in support of our police department, our sheriff's department, our fire department, and the firefighters union as well. Um, and I want to make it clear here that the mayor and commission have been supporting the, those three uh, departments as well over the past year. Um, they received 30% of the Athens Clark, 37% of the Athens Clark County budget. That's just under $60 million. It's by far the most money that goes to any section of, of the community. We've also committed to giving our public safety uh, employees raises over these years, and that's paid off. Um, Yes, we did have a problem, and, and we still do have a problem in the police department, but it has pr improved tremendously. There's just some new stats that are out um, just this month. Um, with Right now, we have 30 new hires in the police department, and we're down to a 10% vacancy. Um, we need to do the same thing for the sheriff's department, uh, where there still is a 26% vacancy. We really need to uh, support them, because without having the people in place, you can't do the job. We know that. Um, there's also a perception that there's more crime, and there is more crime in certain areas, and we've had some horrendous um, incidents in, in recent months. There's no doubt about it. But the police department also shared with us uh, statistics in the last couple of months in 2024 that crime is down 10% here in Athens. Um, this is a PowerPoint that they shared with us. I'm going to put it on my Facebook uh, page tomorrow. Um, there is so there's a perception, and it's our role as commissioners to make sure people understand what's going on and how we are supporting our our, our uh, public safety officers. But there's real problems here, 
And the real problems um, really were epitomized by the, the tragic, tragic death of baby Dro back a month ago, a three-year-old who was hit in gun and gang violence. And this gun and gang violence is something that we as a community have to face. And it's very much tied into lack of opportunity in youth development, lack of, lack of uh, opportunities to, to productively engage people. Um, we have a uh, delinquency prevention initiative with the Boys and Girls Club has this actually, and that Commissioner Fisher and I serve on to help address these issues. But we have to look them in, in the eye and see how we can come together the, the, the community, the nonprofits, the government, the religious groups, and so forth. Um, finally, I want to bring up one other thing that we don't think about, but I have to do this for my advocates on the east side who have been knocking on my door since day one and before I got elected, and that is to improve our EMS service. Because safety is also about what happens when you have an emergency, when you feel, when you're having a stroke, a heart attack, or there's some kind of, you know, your, your chainsaw goes into you. Right now, I, and I hate saying this, but uh, uh, this is a final thing. There are paramedics on every ambulance in Madison County and Oglethorpe County. That is not true here in Athens, and we need to do something about it. Uh, and Jason, uh, again, the question. Yeah, yes. public safety. <laughs> and then we're going to go to audience questions after Melissa answers. What, if any, questions are needed to ensure public safety in Athens Park County? And what funding and from where would you recommend um, if you made those changes? I, I thought there were some great ideas here. I, I really liked a lot of them. I think my focus would be on community policing. I think that was addressed. Um, I think that starts a little bit with um, affordable housing as well. I'd love for our police officers, our EMS, our firefighters to be able to live and work in the communities that they serve. I think that's a good way to forge those relationships so that, you know, we they, they know... Um, the lay of the land before they even get there, and they can help address some of those problems. I think technology is huge. We should utilize some technology, and, and especially for those emergency services of fire and EMS, um, cameras, you know, and different things that we could have up that would, I guess, take um, less human resources when we talk about uh, funding. Uh, it would be something that's permanently there that maybe allows them to get to the problem faster uh, and with the proper resources necessary. Um, obviously, um, any sort of increase in funding and incentivizing uh, more police officers, especially veteran police officers, to come this way, I think would be great. Because I think sometimes when you rely on cadets coming up, they might make the mistake uh, that you talk about the, the one bad uh, being scrutinized and, and put on the, the rest of the force. So uh, some of those things I think would be huge. Um, but yeah, community policing and, and really being involved with, with everybody and, and the youth development I think those are all great points, and I think it's not a one-size-fits-all. I think all of these things could really contribute uh, to having a better, better public safety. Thank you all. I'm, I'm going to read Melissa's statement, and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, Melissa said, <clears throat> ACC has been significantly increasing investment in public safety initiatives for several years, not just in needs of our police force and correctional facilities, but in preventative measures such as mental health in initiatives, youth development, accountability courts, and community outreach. These measures are paying off in indisputable statistics uh, show that crime is down significantly in all categories across our community. The one category where it is down only slightly, which is 3%, is shootings. This is obviously attributable to to the pervasiveness and permissiveness of firearms in our society, and we must do more as a community leaders, as a de democratic society in general, to pressure elected state leaders to enact well-registered gun laws in the state of Georgia and throughout the U.S. The realities of a militarized citizenry, citizenry mean that our officers require intensive and expensive training and risk as they face the increased likelihood that any tense situation could erupt in gun violence. I believe the state of Georgia should increase financial support for local police forces, particularly in communities impacted by gun violence. And that was from Commissioner Link. All right, and we already have, I mean, we've got people already with their hands up in the back. Um, and what we're gonna try to do one more time, and then I'll, you'll be first, sir, in the back. Um, we do want this in the form of a question, um, and uh, if you've already asked one question, we'll go to somebody else with their hand up that hasn't had a chance to ask a question. Um, so the gentleman in the back, um, go ahead and say it loudly so we can pick you up, I think, on the microphone that's being taped. I'm not sure. Thank you, and, uh, and all y'all can speak up a little bit louder, help my 71-year-old ears. Um, 
appreciate all of you being here. My question is to Stephanie, and I'd like to first off congratulate all of you who I don't think had the questions in advance like maybe somebody else did uh, to think about. You know, you, you know, they, you know, they all but Stephanie, my question to you is how many commission meetings as an auditor have you sat through and over how many years, and how do you think that lends to your experience uh, yeah, as far as your hopes to represent the 6th District? Okay, over the six years from 2015, uh, well, 2014 in that office, the Office of Operational Analysis, uh, through 2021, I think I missed two commissioner meetings. I attended every one. And when we were, um, I was required to attend the voting meetings, but I oftentimes um, also went to the, the agenda setting meeting as well as the work session because there is just so much to learn and um, how that translates um, to my experience is that not only I had my my day-to-day -day job of working eight to five in the capacity of the internal auditor the management analyst and the budget budget analyst I learned a lot about all three areas you know data analytics as a management analyst um, the budget I was one of the four individuals that wrote five years worth of the budget document that's a 450 page document that this only four of us and and then I, I transferred over to um, the auditor's office, and then we began reviewing um, our, our departments, our programs, and our agencies, and it was based on what was approved by the mayor and commission. But what I learned more about um, the operations is the, it, the inconsistent practices between the departments, but just generally, the operations of the government is a lesson in itself. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. anyway, yes, ma'am. Uh, this question is for Carol. Yes. On the housing strategic plan, why is the down payment 18%, the down payment assistance 18% versus 20%? I don't know the answer to that, Maura, um, but that is something that I would find out and get you an answer back. Well, she I talked to Alejandra Cotta twice, and I asked her to speak to the mayor and the commissioners in reference to that down The 18 versus 20%? Yes. I do not know the answer to that, Maura. Um, well, I, I spoke to her about I will follow up. That's with that. Thank you for that, and I will follow up and learn more, because that's what I try to do as a commissioner. Um, I don't know the answers to everything. And uh, I find them out when I don't know. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, that's not a no. That's that's a. Uh, 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 how, you want to ask me how many hours I've been in meetings in the last month? I'm not sure what she covered or not. Let's make sure that we have questions, please. Um, so, and Commissioner Myers, thank you, and she'll get back to you on that answer. Somebody else have a question? Anyone? Oh, I don't see. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, I, I like that. Say that they were supporting of diversity and welcoming of people in the community, um, regardless of what their uh, race is, regardless of what their se sexual orientation, or whether they are immigrants or not. You know, I've lived in communities around here that are very unwelcoming, so I'd like to know what uh, their positions are. Excellent, everybody. Um, Jason, we'll start here. Do you want to start here? What your position is on the 2019, was that, was that an executive resolution? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, that was in 2019. Here we are in 2024. I think we as a, a city should make it clear that uh, we're just following state and federal law. That's what we're tasked to do. Uh, I think this community has always been very welcoming, especially to those coming here to enrich this community. So absolutely, if you're coming here to enrich it and make a better life for yourself, you're more than welcome. But I also think we should make it clear that we're following the state and federal laws that we're required to do. I guess I don't really, I don't really understand what the I'm, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. I just, I, I barely heard the question, and I don't really understand. There was a resolution in 2019 um, okay. that uh, was a statement by the mayor and the mayor of the mayor commission okay. about being a, a welcoming community to everybody um, okay. with diverse backgrounds, um, 
it, 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 I don't remember the exact, and I apologize, okay. um, but that resolution has come into question in recent weeks. Um, and so I think that's what the gentleman is asking, is if you support that resolution. Okay. Well, I mean, Athens is a welcoming community. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm an example of that, right? I was born in Hartford, Connecticut, um, culturally, um, Jamaican. I've come here. I've worked here for 30 years. My mom's American. She brought us here. We've worked very hard. I own several businesses, lots of property. I think that's a testament to how welcoming Athens has been. Um, it's afforded me a lot of opportunities being here in Athens and being able to network and getting to know the community. And so, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm agreeing with you, Jason, that, you know, we are a very welcoming community and I don't want to see us, you know, I don't want to see that go away. If that is the specific question, because I want to make sure I answer your question, but if that is a specific question, no, I don't want to see us go away because then people like me won't be here. Um, so thank you. I just want to make sure I understood um, the question was, do we support the mayor the mayor related um, resolution that was uh, introduced in 2019. Is that, is that the question? Okay. So here's my question in a nutshell. I do not, I, I support some of the language tangentially. However, I don't support the way that it was introduced to the uh, full mayor and commission. I was at that meeting. I was sitting right there. And it was introduced as a general resolution, just like the number of resolutions that we see. Let's just say that um, the Leisure Services Department, they, they did something phenomenal. So there's going to be a resolution. It was it was reduced, the significance and the, and the subsequent events that occurred was reduced and was not communicated. I don't think many commissioners would say that they agree, um, not publicly, but if you watch the meetings intently like I do, it does not appear that they do agree with how they were duped and how they now have to face the consequences for something that they had no part in. I am not... Um, against inclusion. I'm not against um, people from various backgrounds. I travel the world and I love it and so I, I welcome people here. You know, there's a process to get in and out the country. I, I support that process. Thank you, Stephanie. Sydney? My family moved here from Auburn, Alabama. I didn't feel any, any animosity at all when I moved to Athens, Georgia. I have never known Athens to be a biased city. That's why we became the classic city. I believe that the resolution has run its course. I believe that we have, we have reached tilt on the different populations that, that need our help, that come here for our help, and we need to be able to treat them fairly with dignity and help them with their problems. Uh, I have never known, I, 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 I've lived in a neighborhood where we had every race, languages. When I was on the school board in our schools, we had 88 different languages. I think that speaks for the diversity that Clark County has, will have, and how we accept one another. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know what, I'm gonna speak directly to this. I wasn't on the commission in 2019. The mayor and commission voted for it 100%. I believe it's available to watch online and I've read, I've, I've, I have seen pits of it recently and it looked like everyone was very supportive and it actually was a very uh, heartwarming place in, in, uh, in City Hall where many in our immigrant community spoke up. They, they were concerned. This was a time when families were being separated because of immigration status, when there had been a, a shooting and a, a, I think it was a Walmart in, in, uh, in Texas, um, at, specifically aimed at uh, immigrant community. Okay. That's a resolution then. If I will say this directly, if I was on, had been on the, on the commission in 2019, I would have signed that, that uh, resolution. And I wanna make it clear why it's important. 
Because right now, if you're in City Hall, you see a lot of people holding signs that say, repeal 2019 resolution. They also indicate that it was something that came from our mayor. This was voted on by the whole commission, not just our mayor. Some people who are no longer on the commission, some people who aren't. Um, so I support the mayor and I support the commission and what they did. But let me also make it clear that a resolution is a statement of, peop of value. It, shows no, it, it carries no legal weight. We do have a sheriff, I believe he's in here, uh, or he was before, and he is following the rules as they are, they are uh, dictated by the state and by the uh, ICE as well. Um, and I think we'll continue to do that. I, I know we will continue to do that. Um, I just wanna make sure it's really clear that I am proud that Athens is a welcoming community for UGA students, for seniors retiring here, for the film industry, for the LGBTQ community, for people with different perspectives and points of view, and for our immigrant and Hispanic community as well. And I will not back down from that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Myers. And I think we have two more questions, three more questions, hold on. Um, we have Russ, oh, four more questions. Russell, maybe five, and we'll see if we can get through them all here, you all. Russell, Broderick, uh, Commissioner Hewell, uh, and I'm sorry, I do not know you in the back. Oh, yes, I do, um, yes, I do. And you will be, yes, Gallagher. Um, yes, Ms. Gallagher, we'll get to you too. Uh, go ahead, Russell, sorry. Um, last year, 21 people died on Athens roads a record. Uh, we passed a Vision Zero pledge, but have not really followed through with much action. You know, it took 23 years to get one third of a mile of protected lane on Prince Avenue. I hope we don't have to wait 23 more years for another one third of a mile, but seeing the Barber Street bike lane get shot down was certainly disheartening. To extend the, network. the question is, what's your plan to address Vision Zero? How are we going to attack this problem with all these people dying on Athens Street? So they want to go to the Jason going to jump right Jason, I'm going to go first. No, yeah, I think that's a good point. I think we do need to have safe streets. Uh, and again, I kind of pointed to it with a little bit of that technology. I think that we could definitely... You know, I grew up in a, a smaller town uh, inside of West Palm Beach, and um, it was about a three-mile uh, circumference around a lake. And um, family members, friends, anyone who came there, we had a, we had our own little police department in that township, and they were they didn't do much of anything. There wasn't much to do, but one thing they did do was hand out speeding tickets, and uh, you made sure you came stopped at a stop sign. Uh, and that was just a reputation for that town. Nobody used it as a thoroughfare and everybody drove safe and you felt safe on the street. So to me, uh, you know, having some stringent laws in place or we already have the speed limit laws, but maybe addressing some of those speed limit issues and having the right technology in place that not only would help uh, traffic deaths, I think, in, in different congested areas, but also EMS, fire, police. I think that would really help uh, and be kind of a dual pronged solution to a couple of things we've discussed up here today. I would just say any death on our streets, regardless, um, you know, and I've, I've said this before, you know, self-defense, you know, but any deaths on our streets is unacceptable. And I think that any lengthy period to address any type of death, especially transportation death, and I think all of us at one point or another mentioned about our traffic issues and our infrastructure issues, all of those need to be addressed immediately, not as you what did you say earlier? Kicking the can down the road. You know, they need to be addressed today, right now. You know, but that's not something we have to wait just to get on the commission. That's something we could be advocating for as constituents and should be and need to be. That's my position. Okay, really quickly, I just want to make sure I make this extremely clear. When I said I am, I support a welcoming community, I do. I did also add to that that I follow rules and policies and guidelines to get into the country and to another country. And the only thing I said was I support others doing the same thing. So I like people of all backgrounds, colors, faiths. It doesn't matter. I don't want anyone to mis misquote me and say that I was against this. I do support that. But when it comes to Vision Zero, I think there are some pockets in my, in my district, District 6, where 
there are no bike lanes, there are no um, sidewalks at all. And when I say it's been that way since 1982, and I cannot believe that some of these areas have not made it to the list. So those are things that I'll be paying attention to. Thank you. Uh, I tend to have a problem with uh, concentrating on, on spending money on what applies to 1% of our population. Uh, until we start creating more bike lanes, we need to be working on the pipes that are under those streets. We have, we have created so many uh, new bedrooms in, in Athens, and we have not replaced the pipes. Uh, there are whole sections of Athens that do not have septic. They, bed, they beg for it. I know families, families in, in District 8 on a street that when they chose not to have, uh, if you want sewer, you could have it. If you did, you didn't have to sign on. That was 50, 60 years ago, and now they're being told it's going to cost $140,000 up front for five families to get on sewer plus an additional $5,000. You know, is, I, I don't see this as being very friendly to the taxpayers. Uh, so I am, I, I, I am not a big supporter of increasing more bike lanes. Uh, when I see bikes crisscrossing uh, lanes, uh, running red lights, uh, that, get, that gets me hurt. I'll be honest with you. I also want to make clear that I in no way look down upon the homeless or look down upon any unbedded resident in our community. We all we have laws for a reason. We have families that have lived in Athens 30, 40, 50 years who are unvetted immigrants. They live by the law. They're always looking over their shoulder. I understand that. But that's because they came here under the law. And as long as you live like everybody else does, there is no problem. I welcome all. Thank you. And, and Cindy, if you see me running a red light on my bike, please call the police. <laughs> okay, listen. <laughs> you know, I think about it. There's sometimes. Uh, but anyway, back to the question at hand. Um, I want to address a couple of things right up front. Um, in, in if we are talking about bike and sidewalk infrastructure in Athens, right now that money is not coming from the general bud budget. It's coming from our T SPLOS 2023 and our SPLOS 2020 program that were voted on by the, the, the people of Athens. The, uh, the mayor and commissioner ca commission cannot not do those projects. Another thing, and I'm not pushing for this because I am a cyclist. I want cycling to be safe, but I also want people walking to be safe. If we as a community and a commission want to, we could take all the money that's, that's in Splash and just put it on sidewalks because there, I don't think there's any that's limited to bikes. So when people say, oh, you're making all that money, you're, you're putting all that money onto bikes, that's a choice we're making as elected body. And that's a choice that I want to make but we as an elected body have power to d direct the, where we're spending the money on, on bikes and uh, a sidewalk. I do want to mention in our local safety plan that we just uh, approved at the last March meeting, intersection crashes are where 75% of crashes go on. So right now, uh, we're actually just approved some uh, money for intersection and uh, some of my fellow commissioners in here, one of them in the back, Commissioner Hull, put forth with Commissioner Wright uh, an increase of funding for that so we could address all the identified intersections um, that for this year we need to continue uh, addressing uh, the question at hand, making sure that we have money to go for those intersections. I also want to uh, address equity because in our new transportation, uh, residential transportation plan, and also in Athens in Motion, those, those projects are ranked uh, to give projects that are in places where there are fewer, more people walking, fewer people owning cars, and more people living in poverty. So that's one of the criteria that's used in the ranking that we do when we spend money. Thank you. Thank you. Broderick. Um, I, I do want to give a little bit of context to some of the remarks earlier, but I do, I do have a question. Like, respectfully, reparations is repair for a direct harm um, to the people 
capable of harm and the Justice and Memory Project is not going that directly to descendants of Leonardtown. So I think I have to be careful when we frame that as reparation. I, I was uh, quoting the website. I understand. But the website too. Uh, okay. And so I, and I understand why we can't do direct payments because of the state gratuity law, um, which is something that also needs to be addressed. But my question is related to the disparity study um, that was done in 2022. Um, when that disparity study was completed in 2023, it showed that there's significant disparity, racial disparity, in terms of the utilization of women-owned, minority-owned businesses, specifically black-owned businesses as well. Um, with that new disparity study and the findings, the local government is pursuing avenues to rectify that, to bring more balance. Um, if you candidates are a uh, part of the elected officials who want to carry that work out, what does that look like to support that work? Anybody? Oh, Rashi wants to go first. And I'll go first because I know Broderick specifically has been working on community benefit agreements with new industries and businesses that come in and new development. And so one of the examples of that is the mall redevelopment. Um, they had put in a uh, 70,000 square feet um, percentage block of um, space that is dedicated directly to minority and women-owned businesses. That is one of the examples. And so to continue um, those conversations, um, especially as a woman-owned, minority-owned business, um, it is very important to me to be able to see that there are spaces made um, for women and minority-owned businesses um, when we have these developments come in, but not just the developments that we have that come in, but also ones that we create. And that's why I'm constantly pushing for, you know, rehabbing a lot of these abandoned buildings and making shared spaces and being able to create spaces that right here in Athens we can utilize. And none of those have anything to do with changing the density. Why? Because those buildings already exist. And those opportunities would further exist if we make them readily available. Tell people what is out there. There are programs out there that will take our young um, women and our, um, our young minorities out of school and will train them to be contractors, you know, that will bring them in to not just do the construction jobs, but also be the leaders of those jobs, to be able to have their own businesses. I know people say I harp on business and, you know, it's about a living wage, but that's how we get there. We make what we already have in place available and have people know what we have and encourage our kids to get in these programs or our houseless to get into these programs or uh, I, I really don't like that word when we keep saying you know um you know, our poverty stricken, but, you know, having those who have challenges, how about that? Having those who have financial challenges to know about what's already readily available so that they can be able to have what we call the come up. And so, and, and then also, you know, people being able to create their own lane. There are a lot of people in this room who have ideas. I'm sorry. There's a lot of people in this room who have ideas and they would love to be able to see them come to fruition. And whether you know it or not, whether you go to the colleges or you go to some of these nonprofits or you look for some of these grant programs, there are opportunities available. You just have to be told where they are. Whomever. I think Stephanie lifted her mic. She's ready to go. Okay, so my take is, is a little different from, and it um, stems from my experience working in the finance department between 2010 and 2014 and a half. And at that time, they actually had a, a minority business um, enterprise employee. I think they had two at the time. So I, I do support it. That's the short answer. However, what I've seen it... So what I've seen to happen is it be the most underutilized um, um, position in the entire department. So what I remember about this position and what, I, and what I remember later on when I was required to review it is that this particular role is to actively, that person who holds that job, is to actively go out into the community and seek and look for and recruit minority businesses. Like Rashi said, lift, 
up, lift businesses up, encourage them, you know, maybe partner with um, businesses who have a vacancy to maybe move them into that space. This is an aggressive every day out in the streets. Almost you're just talking to businesses and you're and you're looking for places to um, plant your minority small business owners so that they can flourish. You're also supposed to provide training at least three times a year. I know for a fact none of that was happening. So I think it's a great program, but there is no oversight, and it seems to be the most, or the least, excuse me, important. I have not been in touch in the last two years, but that is my, that's my more than 10 year experience. When it was started, they took it away in 2012, and then recently when diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I'm so sorry, became popular, they brought it back. Okay, um, I just want to uh, uh, say that what we're doing with this disparity study, and as uh, Broderick knows that this, was, this disparity study had to be done so that we could implement programs in athens Clark County. Um, the Government Operations Committee, which is made up of five of the commissioners, I am not on there, the, the, uh, the chair is right over there uh, in the doorway. Um, we just, uh, I believe, sent this back to the GOC to further refine. So one thing I would welcome from anyone here are ways that we can do that, and I'll be looking at more closely to make sure something concrete comes out of there, because the whole point of this disparity study was so that we could address minority and women-owned uh, disparities in how we do the hiring Athens Clark County. I will be greatly disappointed if we don't have anything concrete to move forward on. Jason. In 1983, not one bank in Athens, Georgia, would loan me $29,000 to start Mama Sid's Pizza. I had to go to a county county and a county state bank welcomed me and gave me that loan. I owe them my livelihood. I understand what it is to want to start a business and you just keep getting doors shut in your face. I uphold anybody who has the guts to step out to open a door to people to give your to do your sales and services to 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 sit down on anyone who wants to do this is totally unfair, uncalled for, and illegal. I support any program that can help anyone to become an entrepreneur. I would tend to agree with that as well. Um, I'd like to see more entrepreneurship programs out there, especially for our youth. I think a lot of times when we look at the way we school our kids, we're kind of schooling them uh, to maybe go on to secondary education. What about the focus on being an entrepreneur and looking in your own community and seeing a need and, and figuring out a way to fill that need and monetize it and create a job and make your community better. I think that as entrepreneurs, that's what we look to do. Um, my wife and I were the same way. Uh, trying to get a loan back in 2010 wasn't easy. And uh, we were able to, through the uh, SBDC, uh, get some help in making a business plan, an Excel sheet that really uh, put us on the path to success and allowed us to open up our business, which has been uh, open now for uh, going on 13 years, be 14 in August, and um, allowed us to put roots down in this community. And I'd like to encourage uh, anyone who wants to get into the entrepreneur, any program that helps in that entrepreneurial spirit, I think is really good for the town. Absolutely. All right, Commissioner Houle. Yeah, so uh, this is an election, obviously, and here in Clark County, our elections for local office are nonpartisan. Um, but we are aware, of course, that there are parties, Democrat and Republican. And just as a brief background, I promise, but it's going to lead to very short answers to my question. Um, a, a huge thing has changed in Clark County in recent years, where we see tens of thousands of dollars funneling into local elections, where it used to be ten, maybe fifteen thousand dollars was plenty to win for a commission race. And this money's coming from all over the state, who knows where actually, in part because while some campaigns are raising 30, 50,000 dollars 
we have PACs that have been forming, and we've been sending out mailers and doing push call, you know, push polling and phone banking and things for, for candidates. Uh, the fun thing about PACs is you don't know who gave the money to the PAC, and that money is from undisclosed numbers of people, it's undisclosed amounts. Uh, but you do know when you get something like a mailer in the mail, who paid for it? Question. So the question is, question. there are neighbor, there are there are PACs in this community that we've seen, who knows what they'll be called this time around, like Neighbors for a Better Community or Athens Plan Safe or Keep Athens Classic. And my question for each of you, because the answer obviously is no, you're not going to take money directly from the PAC. But will PACs, will PACs be circulating literature or doing work in support of your campaign? I have no idea. I'm not in politics. I just got into this to try and make my community better, so I honestly do not know. I think you mentioned we're unable to work with PACs. Is that correct? Donors. People that donate to me. That's who's giving my money. Uh, family members, friends. Are we going to have an argument? or You asked the question. I have no idea. MalcolmFordCommissioner.com. If anybody would like to donate, it is very hard <laughs> to get money <laughs> for campaigns. So, I, you know, I don't know any PACs. Um, you know, so I'll just say that, you know, we are running a grassroots uh, campaign here. Um, mailers are $3,000. So if anybody would like to donate to my campaign, just hit the donate button and we thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I've been, well, I've been called a walking conflict and I embrace it because some people say you're not democratic enough or you're not Republican or you hang around Republican people. So for people who are not from Athens, Georgia, the people you see in my images are people I grew up with and oops, by chance, they might be a, a Republican. Oops, and by chance, they might be a Democrat. I have no idea about PACs. I can't speak to it. I raise every single dollar and, the, and here's the joke. Every single day I wake up, you can ask my husband, I'm asking somebody for money. And so I'm Steph46, great idea, Steph46.com, <laughs> and I have a QR code. I raise money every day, every single day. I am electmamasid.com. <laughs> Uh, I, I am running on, on a very, very slight budget. Uh, I even had someone give me 75 cents the other day at my store. I said, thank you very much. Anything helps. Uh, Jesse, this is nonpartisan, and it's nonpartisan for a reason. <laughs> who, who I vote for for president has absolutely nothing to do with my local government. I will look at what the needs of my district are and vote accordingly. All of my campaign literature will have on it uh, paid for by the committee to elect, re-elect Carol Myers. Um, and that's the, my answer. Um, I think Ms. Gallagher, she was next. Sorry, sorry, Tim. I had to, she had already had her hand up earlier. And I do not have a time piece. Are we run? We're over time, I imagine. We are already over time. Okay. And I would say uh, maybe just five more minutes because our good friends here at TNA have to clean up yeah. after all of us, and they don't want to stay here forever tonight. So, um, so yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so as you may already know, intentional collaboration between county government, CCSE, and UGA is almost, I feel, sometimes non-existent. Um, what steps are you prepared to take as a commissioner to ensure that the core issues mentioned here today, public safety, public safety, homelessness, and affordable housing, um, are addressed through collaboration with CCSE and the UGA? It's a great note to end on. So this will be the last one, and I want to thank you ahead of time, you all. Thank you. Uh, Jacobs for Athens. A couple people left. Didn't get that in. Uh, anything I can. That's, uh, that's the answer. Anything I can. I, I feel like, first and foremost, you have to have a conversation. I know you're going to have differences with each of those organizations about how things need to go, but we need to work together uh, and figure out the needs of one another 
uh, and ways to fulfill those needs. I mean, especially the, the fractured relationship with the university, I think, is that's such a, a, a huge resource uh, for a bunch of different things that we've talked about. I mean, they have an entrepreneurship uh, school that they've started. So, I mean, how are we not utilizing some of those things to accomplish what we're talking about? They have services as well that we should be utilizing. They use some of our services. So I feel like that should be a more symbiotic relationship uh, when you're we're not at one, what's good for them is good for us, what's good for us is good for them, and I feel like we need to get there. Uh, CCSD, same way. I feel like um need to collaborate with them as a city to what their needs are, and uh, what was the other organization you mentioned? Yeah, well, there you have it. I really do think that there there is a fractured relationship, and there's too much contention, and we need to come together and figure out ways that we can work together to accomplish a lot of the goals, because I don't think we can't do it on our own, and they can't do it on their own. So I do, I do feel that that uh, relationship needs to be more symbiotic than it is right now. Oh, I'm happy to answer this question because I'm already involved in the partnership with all of us. Um, so as a board member for the Chamber of Commerce, Commerce, we are, as a business industry, um, already collaborating with CCSD, the local government, as well as UGA on a lot of these uh, programs. And so the entrepreneurship program is already in, you know, our classic city um, uh, high school already has like the, you know, the catering programs um, that we're a part of. Of, um, as well as, you know, I mean, they have mechanics, you know, anything you can think of. And as business owners, we are now actually heavily recruiting um, students as interns so that they can get that practicum experience as well as the education. And then when they come out, if they choose not to go to secondary school with somebody brought out, they don't have to. They can go straight into the workforce. Um, and so I think those collaborative efforts are already going on. And I think that more more people need to encourage it and they need to also um, push for if they don't see any of their local officials or if they don't see UGA or somebody from the school board speaking out against it, you really need to ask them why and tell them to sit in on a meeting because we are making things happen with our kids in this community and wish more people would see it. I support collaboration. I don't know how easy it will be, but it's something I'm really interested in learning out, learning how to bridge the gap. I've uh, been, a, been a witness, a fly on the wall for many small private meetings, and I could not understand why um, the, the playmakers, the top of the people at the top of their respective organizations just would not get along. And I thought in, in different pockets they would, but when it came to the bosses, the bosses, the president or the manager, it was very unsuccessful. And I, I could never figure that out. Um, I'm not sure if it's a liability issue. I'm not sure if it's an ego issue. I don't know what the, what the answer is, but I do um, support collaboration. I think it's healthy, and I think it's, it provides exposure. When I was in high school, I was allowed to go on campus to the um, French lab laboratory, and I became very fluent in French, you know, in my last three years of high school because of collaboration back then. So I do support collaboration. I want, would like to see that. Athens is here because of the University of Georgia. The fact that the two entities, the government and the university, don't get along very well truly amazes me. I do not understand it. The fact that the University of Georgia and Clark County School District don't get along very well. I know when I was on the board, we begged to have, to have people from the university in our classrooms and it just never worked. When I was on the school board, we had a hard, a hard we, when I was, uh, on my first year, we passed our first East Blast. We had a hard time getting approval, working with our local government to, to build our new schools, to renovate new schools. So what the animosity between all three entities is, is something I have never understood, but I do, I am only one vote, but I will do what I can to increase a more pleasing, let's get together attitude. Hi, um, I heard this, uh, you know, there's, the people say, oh, the university doesn't get along. We all don't get along with the government and such. I heard something at another forum recently, so I went and asked our county management office, do you guys ever meet with the UGA? Yes. 
There's a group of them that meet every week or two. I did not write it, I don't have my notes here. They meet very regularly. Um, we meet with the school board. I have met with the school board to work on our youth development work. Yes, we could have more meetings. Yes, we always can do things better. There's always room for improvement. But I think we also, as commissioners, have a responsibility to nurture that positive relationship as well. Um, there was a traffic light out on College Station. Okay, I was able to, well, actually, no, let's take that back parking lot on College Station. You might be wondering, what's going on there? I reached out to the community uh, liaison, uh, Allison McCulloch, to ask her about that. That was not a problem, reaching out to her. I'm on campus, I was on campus last week, working with UGA students on a sustainability board, and have been working with them uh, in many other occasions as well. Likewise, we were recently with a fellow commissioner at the Clark County, the uh, Career Center, learning about what they're doing so that we can collaborate with them as we work forward with our workforce development. Um, perhaps we should do a better job explaining what we are doing to build these relationships. They are happening, we can always do better, um, and I will be working for that as we move forward. But um, we have as a responsibility as commissioner, it's not always someone else's fault. Each of us individually as commissioners can make a difference to improving those relationships. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Rashi. Thank you, Stephanie, Sydney, and Commissioner Myers. Let's all give them a hand for being here tonight. And I know I wasn't the best moderator, but I got to keep my day job. I'm not quite ready for retirement, so thank you for bearing with me. And please join us at Federation of Neighborhoods. You can join online. We have membership and look forward to uh, the next forum. So thank you all for being here as well.